we are now into the panel session, and the title is Cybercrime, Can We Keep Up? And this is basically quite a nice continuation, I think, from the talk that we had this morning from Samantha, um, where we had about the cybercrime landscape. And so to explore it a little bit further with us, and of course with your help asking the questions, we have a panel of expertise before us. So uh, moving from furthest away and then closest to me, we have Victoria Stone, Cyber Protect Officer from Southwest Police Regional Organised Crime uh, Cybercrime Unit. So Victoria is a member of that unit, specifically part of the team investigating cyber-dependent criminality and promoting the message designed to protect businesses, emergency services and critical infrastructure from the effects of cybercrime. We then have one of our regular panellists who's now becoming, Pete Woodward from Securius, uh, Chief Information Officer there, um, the founder and Chief Information Officer of Securius, uh, one of our event sponsors for the day, um, a wealth of knowledge around cyber security in general, system architecture and networks. And then closest to me, uh, Nathan Clark, Professor Nathan Clark, Professor of Cyber Security and Digital Forensics from here at Plymouth University. He has research interests in the areas of information security, biometrics, forensics, and intrusion detection. And he's now waiting for me to say something nasty about him, but I'm not going to. He has over 180 outputs, consisting of journal papers, conference papers, books, edited books, book chapters, and patents, some of which I'm a co-author on. Is that not right? Yes. Okay, so without further ado, some of which I wrote for him. Uh, <laughs> There we are, it was coming. <laughs> okay, so basically, the floor will be yours very shortly, but let's have a little bit of scene setting um, to give the panel a, a chance to express their views on the issue generally. So in a landscape panel characterized by hacking, malware, phishing, and other online attacks, how is cybercrime affecting trust and confidence in the technologies we now depend upon? And if nobody wants to immediately answer, and remember when you want to answer, you press your button to turn your microphone red, I will pick on someone. Uh, well, that's a threat if they, if they don't get to it. Uh, go on, Nathan. You're, you're ready to go. Okay, I, I can start. I guess I think it's a very difficult question to answer. I think it depends upon the audience you're talking about. Um, if I'm looking at the end user in terms of the general public, I think the, the risks and threats are, are varied. And for me, if I look at my, my parents, who are probably the elderly proportion of society, and banking and financial-based applications are probably the biggest risk at the moment. They're very fearful about using online services where they have to communicate such, in, such information. And I don't think many of the services where you have to pay for products provide a potentially consistent message to the end users either, and which makes it very confusing. Yeah, just to add to that, I think it's uh, obviously technology is becoming a way of life now and um, as we adopt and adapt to it, um, there's going to be these risks more more prevalent and um, I think the way we interact with technology as an enabler is, is really critical to how we best secure ourselves. Um, obviously coming from a policing point of view, we have found that the public are finding that they don't trust technology as much, obviously the, with cybercrime going up and everything. So from our point of view, obviously we want to make sure that we can protect the public, we can investigate cybercrime for them. And especially with um, technology we rely on, such as our smartphones now, you assume that the apps that you download are going to be safe, but with the introduction of things such as banking trojans now, whereby um, they can cover the interface of your app and they can hack into your smartphones. We don't really know if the apps that we used to trust on our phones are actually protected. So it's just getting that message across to people and trying to install a bit more confidence in them that we can help and also that they can look after themselves as well, which is also a big factor. Thank you. Any immediate questions? So John's got his hand almost in the air. Now, we've got Shannon running around with the microphone today, so we're trying to do side to side across the marquee, is what she's asked for. Thank you. Um, obviously, the topic is, can we keep up? But one of the first questions before we think about keeping up is, can we actually catch up with what's happened before? And there's probably a massive amount of historical data that's been stolen and get, uh, just swarming around the dark web are we ever going to be able to catch up and find out what's been taken before and actually do anything about that? 
So I was going to say from the police perspective of that, I think the police are playing catch up and they have been for a long time because resources um, and money haven't been put into cybercrime. Obviously the PCC priorities have been things such as domestic, uh, domestic violence and burglary which is quite right but with cybercrime being underreported uh, is something that needs to obviously invest more money into it. Um, so I think from, especially with the new uh, national uh, cyber strategy, I think from the government, obviously now tasking nationally regional police forces and the districts, I think it is helping us to be able to catch up a bit more now and make more of an impact. Yeah, I, I think we're all, always playing catch up. You close one loophole down, the, the, the bad guys will open up another area of uh, crime. If you look at car crime, you used to put the steering lock on when you leave your car. That moved on to really good protections that the car manufacturers built into their cars. That then moved on to um, breaking into your house and stealing your keys because that's the way you steal a car now or, or carjack. So it, there's always that element of uh, catch up, absolutely. I have a stronger opinion. I think you know, if we go back 15 years and look at how we used to use t computing technology, it was a desktop or a laptop computer. You used to have one per household. Even then, we struggled to keep up with security. We struggled to understand from an awareness perspective what we needed to do to maintain security. We now live in a world where we've all got smartphones, smart watches, iPads, smart TVs. The threat vectors coming from multiple platforms from multiple directions, I think is a struggle. I don't think we ever will catch up. All we can try and do is, is do our best and, and keep ahead as much as possible to the kind of main wave of crime. But at the, the, the front end of it, I, I don't think we'll ever will catch up. All the sort of historical data, we just have to accept it's gone and we can do it. Um, yes. Yes. And I think actually that, that goes for, if you look at um, information security more generally in business, I think we have to start developing models where we believe that a proportion of our data might be lost or a proportion of our revenue might be lost due to these types of attacks. And we have to change our business models accordingly to allow for that. The idea that we're going to remain secure, the idea that this information is not going to get lost, that we're not going to be fined by the Information Commissioner's Office and these things aren't going to happen, I, I think have disappeared. Um, there's too many threats, too many different directions. And for all the wonderful things technology brings, which Steve will tell you, I love technology, I'll always buy every, every latest gadget that comes out to see how it works. But those platforms, unfortunately, just um, pervade the, the threat environment that much more. Even as a professor, I struggle to keep up to date with all the possible threats to make sure I'm protected. How are members of society meant to do that? The general members of society, I think, is a big struggle. I think I should clarify, Nathan always gets the university to buy all the latest bits of technology for him. I saw a hand up at the back, I think, there, and one at the front as well. So we'll do the back first. It's a question about regulation, so fun. Um, the the, uh, you, you've talked about devices and things, um, with, but with um, Bluetooth connected car door locks and door locks and heating systems that can tell attackers whether you're in or out of your house for long, extended periods of time, don't you think there's a responsibility on hardware manufacturers and which should be enforced by the government to hold you know, appropriate standards for, for creating of devices you know you can't just throw a device out there and expect it to work from an academic perspective easy answer is yes you know it would be wonderful to think that we live in a world where that would happen and um, you know we have things like the common criteria that are there to make sure that certain devices systems or processes come up to a certain expectation in terms of security what we found however in practice certainly when it comes to consumer electronic devices those things are never applied because it's too costly um, to do so so I, I guess it's that trade-off between function and usefulness versus security. Um, it would be nice to think that security would get a higher priority as we move forward. Whether that happens in practice, though, who knows? Uh, we often have conversations about, uh, imagine a world where you, you drive in from work, you walk into the house and the heating hasn't come on, your kettle hasn't boiled. I mean, w what a nightmare that would be. But you have to understand that, obviously, the consumer market and technology is, is, is rife. You know, people want that ability to do th those sort of things. And um, quite often than not, the, you know, the security element is, is not really built into that, that model. So there's definitely, there's a lot more that could be done, I'm sure. Um, but also in terms of just clicking yes to install a program, you're actually agreeing to all sorts of 
privacy um, legislation that you don't actually know you're agreeing to. So I think there's, there's quite a, that's a whole different area for life uh, concern, yeah, definitely. Um, just to add to that, I agree. People these days want the up-to-date technology. They want convenience. They want uh, products that are best for ease of use. And it just seems like security is dropping off the bottom of it, which makes everyone's job a lot harder in terms of protecting people. And I think, I think there should be standards with things like that. There's a there's a line between wanting something to be convenient for you, just so your door's unlocked when you're within a certain range to your house, but think of all the, the vulnerabilities with that as well. There was a question down the front. Yes. The microphone is on its way. Yes, just so the panellists don't feel neglected, I've got a question for each of them, and they're all different. Look at if, I, now. if I start with Nathan first, um, biometric um, identification, psychometric, well, I don't know if it's going to ever become psychometric, but it's certainly biometric at, at the moment. Uh, it's pretty crude. How, how do you see it becoming more sophisticated and more robust? The question, if I may, to Peter, don't get excited, <laughs> is um, the air interface, um, we are now very much in the mobile domain, and we can secure our base stations and our master stations on mobile networks, but we cannot secure the mobile interface. In your experience and current uh, activities, do you see the air interface as being vulnerable and what are the network providers doing about it? And the question to Victoria is the police are always complaining about lack of resources and no money. Um, how do you see them being able to find the bandwidth and the financial wherewithal to tackle cybercrime? Okay, so a buy one, get two free approach to questioning there. Uh, so, relatively brief answers each of you, just so we allow some other air time for others as well. Okay, um, in terms of biometrics, if we're thinking about biometrics for use in authentication, um, we in Plymouth have been spent the last 20 years working on technologies where we've now begin to see that happening in, in kind of consumer electronics as well. And that's about um, transparency biometrics. So there's this, this basically a, a seesaw of security versus convenience with any authentication technology. Passwords because of the inconvenience of having to enter them. Tokens to carry them. Biometrics, well, they're a bit easier because you carry them with you. But still, anything that requires the user to do something um, is a barrier to that security technology being used. So the idea of transparent biometrics is the devices and the technology you use inherently in the background capture these biometric signals. Um, whilst not, not developed the purpose, the Apple iPhone is probably a nice example of this. You only actually have to leave your finger on for a fraction of a second longer on the home button, which you'd normally press to switch the device on anyway, and it provides fingerprint recognition of the device. You can imagine moving forward that the camera could be used for facial recognition, the voice for uh, speaker recognition. There's a myriad of different biometrics all in the background that could play a role in verifying the authenticity or the, verifying the identity of the user. I can imagine that being rolled out on desktops, on notepads. I believe Google's new OS, Android's going to be coming out with something very, very similar um, in the near future as well. Pretty much what I was going to say. Um, so in the mobile world, I, I think the, uh, the, the telecoms operators, now they're, they're doing, there's so much technology they have at the moment where they can track phones, they can locate phones, you can remote white phones, etc. I think the biggest risk in that environment is the actual human being. So is human behaviours and how they interact with those devices, where they leave them, uh, they use them on the train, you know, in public areas where they're susceptible to be stolen, um, dropped and broken, that sort of thing. So there's a, there's a bit of education around that. And, to that, sorry, I wasn't referring to the ground operations, I was referring to the area between one base station and master station and the next. It's a mobile network. It's not always live on sound. And that area in place is vulnerable. They could do more. I think the mobile operators could do more. Um, there's a lot of um, mobile network sharing. You look at emergency services, they can, um, the airwaves network, they can um, relay off, off stations and stuff. So there's, there's probably a lot, of, a lot more security they could uh, implement around that in, in, in certain data sharing environments, definitely. 
Um, so, with cybercrime being a tier one threat, uh, along with terrorism and natural disasters, the police um, are now aiming to improve their response to cybercrime with the last strategy that came out, the National uh, Cyber Strategy. Um, they introduced what my team is, which is the regional organised crime units. So, we now have cap capability nationally in all the regions to deal with cybercrime, along with a cyber protect. Um, aspect to that, which is what I do. Um, we work closely with the NCA, who have got their National Cybercrime Unit. Um, they have gone through approach such as focusing on the prevent side of things. So looking at, we make referrals to them, so anyone that we come into contact with, with our suspects, we refer them into this new workshop scheme that the um, NCA do, that will kind of move them away from cybercrime and introduce them into some awareness training and some educational programs so that they can earn legitimate money off a job out of it instead of committing crime. And locally on our forces in the districts, we're seeing an increase of specific cybercrime teams and also the introduction of digital PCSOs who are dealing specifically with cybercrime and the individuals. So looking at um, people that have been victims of crime, even things such as cyber stalking up to um, smaller monetary loss. And also, if you're aware of uh, the special constabulary, they're also introducing cyber special so people that in their own time they take a voluntary role of assisting the police um, and dealing with cyber incidents specifically. Okay, I'm going to pose another question from, oh no, a couple of hands at the back, there's eagerness, let's go there. Oh, oh okay. Uh, hi, it's a question predominantly for Victoria I think. Um, given that cybercrime is genuinely global and almost invisible, there must be quite a degree of cooperation amongst police forces around the world and or intelligence agencies. Could you actually give us a little outline without giving away any, anything confidential? But also as a supplement to that, how difficult is it therefore to create an environment of deterrence to actually we're talking about all the preventative measures that we can take but if somebody actually does continue but we catch them how difficult is that given that somebody might be in a completely different country in a political regime which is maybe not terribly cooperative or friendly towards us um, so, in the regional team that I work in, we do work closely with other countries, um, investigations that we've got going on and previous investigations. We work closely with the FBI, um, and that will be in a sharing of intelligence. Um, it may be a case of visiting there, then visiting us, and also work closely through, that will be through like Interpol, and then through Europol, we work closely with European countries. So, obviously, they have to be willing and have the capacity to be able to work with us. Um, but they can set up kind of their own investigation really and take on the intelligence that we've given them to carry on our work and if it needs to be obviously we can go over there and they can come to us as well. So it is difficult obviously with um, say for example like a burglar they could maybe only do three or four houses a day but obviously with cybercrime you can have someone sat anywhere in the world at a computer hitting thousands, hundreds, thousands, millions of people uh, victims a day so it is very very difficult um, but we have been very lucky with the with the communications we have had so far with other countries abroad to work together. Was there another question at the back still? Yep. Yeah, it kind of picks up on a couple of the earlier questions, but it's, I'm interested to find out who is or who should be, as we are a global community facing this issue, chasing, pushing, driving the hardware vendors and the software vendors to deliver product that's fit for purpose, that's actually ready to hit the market and is as secure as it could be. And I realise it is a huge question, but I just, as an individual, as a business person, I don't know who I should be influencing because of the scale of the issue. And I'm just, I wonder... Is the, is, is the work going on in the background, or where does, where does that angle take us? I think if you look at typical security vendors, firewall vendors, that they're, they're developing artificial intelligence and um, 
uh, behavioralist type antivirus and, and then these sort of solutions. So there's a lot of work, I think, and I, I can't talk on most manufacturers, but there, there is a lot of work there, I think, in terms of uh, developing security from the ground up. Um, as consumers and businesses that, that use these products, you know, it's, it's down to us to, to keep our requirements high up there, is, and security has got to be right at the top of that list, so they can start, you know, redeveloping and, and actually moving forward with how the threat landscape changes. I think in highly regulated markets, you've got the driver there. It's the regulation authority that's going to force that to happen. Outside of those marketplaces, I just don't see it happening. Um, the market economies, how they work, the reality is the company's going to want the software released as quickly as possible to get ahead of competitors. You can't fundamentally change that market dynamic, which means what I tend to avoid is avoid the first generation so to make sure it kind of works and does what it wants, and hopefully by Gen 2, they've, they've solved some of the problems. Um, I don't see... You know, I don't think the introduction of more regulatory bodies covering the whole of the area is something that we necessarily want. Um, it's going to be too costly, too time consuming. So yeah, I don't think we can in unregulated markets particularly easy, unfortunately. Question to the front. Hi, um, it's very closely linked to the previous question. Uh, with the imminent arrival of GDPR and uh, data protection by design, does this provide the teeth that's needed for um, uh, building security into this, uh, into these devices and Internet of Things. Thanks for the question. Um, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think it's I think it's uh, an enabler for businesses to actually take control and and look at the the risk within themselves. Uh, previously, the ICO taking adequate protection for data is one thing, but actually being accountable for that now and, and moving forward and how that's all going to be regulated is is getting organisations now to step up to that challenge and and take on board some of the responsibilities that they should be doing anyway and and facing it head on really. Okay, I'm going to get in with another question before Nathan answers on that one. So we've, we've seen, and I think um, in the media we've seen hype around or highlighting around various issues. So ransomware, for example, is something that's been highly reported in recent times. We've seen the discussion around IoT vulnerabilities, and part of that linked to some of the previous questioning. But what should we be most concerned about? And how much do we think that technology can be the, the protection that we need there? Um, I think that obviously you need to have your technical controls within your business and they are very important at giving you that first layer of defense however with most of the things that we're seeing um, in the regional unit it is ransomware and it is network intrusion so it is your cyber dependent crimes however what's caused them is the human factor um, with a lot of those so for example with a recent um, ransomware job that we dealt with it was a employee that decided to go through on their work computer to access their personal emails to click on a link which then encrypted on the on the network all the files and obviously that was something that we got involved in and luckily they've made backups of it but we are tending to see especially with things like remote access tools the ways they're getting through into the network are people with weak passwords so i think technology does provide that good first line of defense but i believe that the weakest link is still the human factor. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that. The, the human factor is definitely uh, plays a, a massive key in that. There's some basic preventative things you can do to, to stop a lot of these, you know, a good 80% of the, 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 the basic sort of uh, attacks, but um, it's, it's down to behaviours and, um, you know, the staff awareness training, the, the, the patching your systems, the, the access controls, you know, there's a whole load of um, basic steps you can take to prevent a lot of these things happening. I would also agree. I, I think for me, if you look at the trends, you know, there's a general rule, low-lying fruit, and hackers will always go after low-lying fruit, and for many years that used to be your SMEs in small organisations because they had money. What we've seen most recently, particularly with ransomware, is us as individuals being hacked. And I think whatever comes next, it's going to be more attacks about on us as individuals, on our systems, on our financial money, um, more examples of ransomware. And I think because of the burden, as I mentioned earlier, being placed on individuals to have to understand all these threats and understand how to protect themselves against that, that that's never going to happen. Awareness strategies are never going to be foolproof enough to protect us, which means there are tens of millions of us vulnerable to those types of attack. And for that reason, there's lots of money to be made from us. 
Do you think we've got a better culture of cybercrime awareness now? Um, I think people are getting better at it. Um, I think an organisation as a whole um, can help by in looking at reviewing your policies quite regularly, looking at least privileges, making sure that people are not given too much access to um, folders and data that they don't no longer need access to. Um, and I think just general kind of monitoring, like reviewing your logs of your network, um, and looking at your access control lists, I think people are getting better at it, but the organisation as a whole could help by reviewing policies, acceptable use policies, so people are less likely to maybe make that error. I think we've become more tech savvy, definitely more tech savvy, um, whether that makes us more secure and, and a bit more aware of our environments is questionable. We, we see day in, day out, the simple things that are catching people out, you know, there's big training programs to, to highlight these issues and, and, you know, there's still a way to go. I think, you know, definitely tech, tech savvy, absolutely, but um, how we use that and how we protect ourselves doing some really simple things, I think we're a little way off. And, and I would agree, I think if you look at the surveys, it's clear that organisations are doing a lot more with respect to information security than they ever did before, which is great. I think the big alarming thing for me that I see anecdotally when I'm talking to companies is how many of them actually are simply playing lip service to much of this. So they've got all the policies in place, they've spent a lot of time putting policies in place, but there's actually nothing really underpinning it, and there's no regular monitoring, there's no instant response, they're not looking at logs, but from a cursory top-end perspective, they can tick a box for due diligence that kind of keeps the regulation or regulatory body happy. Um, I'd like to see more actual practical application and actually employment of the, co the correct countermeasures actually in the organisation itself. I'm not going to name the organisations. Just a question for you, the audience. How many of you, hands up in the air, are concerned about cybercrime? And keep your hands up if you are more concerned now than perhaps you were five years ago. Okay, so that's possibly some interesting insight for the panel there. Um, hands up now if you've got a question that you'd like to ask the panel. Yeah, ah, John again, there we go. Hold on, microphone, microphone's coming to you. There it is. Thank you. Um, most of the attack vectors we see these days, ransomware, viruses, etc., they've been around for 30 years or so, so none of them are new. Um, people are wising up about um, these types of attacks, so they're going to be less effective. What do you see the be, to be the biggest threat in the next five years in the cybercrime arena? I think social engineering um, attacks still the cyber enabled is something that still seems to be growing but again that's something that staff awareness training and again it comes down to the human factor but with the increase of technology every single day with new devices coming out especially that we've talked about with like the home kits that we have and things like that there will be more I think in terms of like trojans of things affecting these newer devices um, network intrusions with things as well so I think and with zero day attacks, you, you don't know what's going to be next, do you, I suppose? But ransomware is the biggest one that we're seeing at the moment, because there's different strains of it. I think if I look to some of our research directions that we're spending time on, I, I think one of the biggest areas we're most concerned about is privacy of data. So with the pervasiveness of smart watches and what would be smart clothing and everything else, the ability to capture and monitor you as an individual and everything you do, and the security of the resulting data that comes out of that, particularly because most of it's pushed to the cloud automatically, I think there's a moment a lack of control over that, and I'm quite worried about what the attackers could do with that information in the form of, of a blackmail or, or whatever else they might decide to use, um, use it for. Any more questions? We have a question there. I want a question from that side of the room in a minute. You're all very quiet. Um, quite recently, um, I think it was like the last weekend, uh, Somebody was on like their Facebook account or something, and uh, it was a sort of elderly lady. Clicked on the link, something was downloaded, and all of a sudden she's had someone like literally talking through a computer, saying that you know if you don't give us one hundred ninety nine dollars, uh, you know we're going to put a virus on your computer. And she then went and paid this money. Um, talking to you is like from the police perspective. Do you have the resources to like sort of like investigate that sort of thing? Is there sort of like a 
a limit of money you know it you look at stuff that's only like i don't know five thousand pounds and above or what sort of thing do you investigate or can you investigate so with that um specific example that you've given um with obviously being able to infiltrate the computer we always as a police perspective would always say don't pay a ransom because you've got absolutely no guarantee that you're going to get the key of his ransomware to unlock your files again and we've seen in the past that if you pay a ransom you're usually put on what's called like a suckers list whereby you're more likely to get hit again um, in terms of our resources to deal with something like that in my team in the regional team our uh, remit is that it has to be a hundred thousand pounds either loss or gain so gain from the criminal or loss to the victim um, cyber dependent crime is something that we usually have in our remit with uh, national security emergency services and public safety however the, the police uh, the districts and the police forces now that is something that they would take on board and, and look at so if that was reported through action fraud the way it goes down it goes through a triage um, service if it hits that criteria that i've just mentioned it comes to us um, that what specific example would get um, allocated to the the force area that it's in and one of their digital media investigators or their cybercrime investigation team would pick up something like that. Looking around for questions. Ah, there's a hand over there. Paid off edge in that way, didn't it, Shannon? <laughs> so, uh, given some of these seemingly lax practices around uh, websites and companies that have <coughs> breaches around their password database. Do you think it's actually responsible that we encourage the use of uh, biometric authentication, uh, given that you only have so many fingers and one face to use? No. <laughs> <laughs> but to elaborate a bit more further, now, you, you're completely right. You know, why, why give even more precious personal information to a company that you can't even trust with a simple password? Um, I think how we envisage things moving forward, I think what makes a lot more sense is is federated identity. So giving people who actually are in the business of securing your credentials, securing your information, and then talking to the individual web clients based upon some kind of federated open ID based approach would make a lot more sense. And then also you don't have your biometric based data distributed between hundreds of different customers or well, hundreds of different websites all over the world. It is in one location, which means it can also be revoked and managed that, more, that much more closely. Oh, hold on. Microphone, please. You're preparing to get one question each now, aren't you? Thank you. No, no, I'm going to be easy this time. That's for the next time. Um, no, the digital footprint concerns me because every time we go online, we leave a footprint. And at the moment, there's no single entity that's responsible to kill the footprint other than the person who created it. But in a lot of these cases, you don't know where to go to delete your footprint. How do you see that, Nathan, panning out? Pressure's on, Nathan. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think GDPR will tackle some of that in terms of um, right to be forgotten and, and taking uh, organizations that have an ownership of, um, or onus really on removing your data at request. So th there's an element, but I, I think it's, it's really difficult to, you know, to delete your, your footprint offline. Um, you know, there's, there's probably a million things you can actually do, but uh, I, I think that that's, that's, pro that's one of my concerns as well. So, you know, I can't really answer you more than that, to be honest. I'm afraid I can't really elaborate either. You know, it, it, it's a technically a very, very tricky situation to be in. I, I think if you go down the route of having federated identity providers that manage your credentials and therefore manage and understand who has access, um, then you've got an ability to release a centralised location to know what you're accessing and who you're inter interacting with. So you've got the ability to have the right forgotten principle. Um, but you're also putting a lot of eggs in one basket, which provides a vast opportunity for the hackers to attack those centralised systems. But it's spreading. I mean, if you think about API when you go on a flight and who shared, who's that information shared with, it goes around the world. Exactly. 
Yeah, yeah. It, you know, even if you, if, if I were to analogise it back to, for instance, access control methodologies, where the idea is, if someone's removed, you also remove all the privileges that person gave to everybody else, and that revocation is a terribly tricky thing to do, particularly over long periods of time. The, the same is with information. Once it's hopped a few places and it's been sent around, it's very difficult to track, very difficult to identify. Oh, hand over there. A question to each of you, actually. Um, if you could do one thing and one thing only to make the biggest difference, what would it be? Money not being the object. That's made them think. Um, I personally, again, see like the human factor as a focus. So from my protect role, something that I would like to change the most is making sure that everyone, not just people that go to events like this, so SMEs that don't go to events like this, vulnerable people, um, are people that are getting the awareness training or understanding the cyber threats so they can help protect themselves at home in work. Because there's a lot of people that aren't reached because they don't have that initial kind of interest or level of cyber knowledge, so they wouldn't necessarily come to something like this. So I'd like to be able to get through to the people that, like elderly vulnerable people that, that need that um, awareness and protection. Yeah, it's, it's, knowing what we know, I probably wouldn't go online, but obviously in this, this day and age, you, you have to go online to, to do normal business functions. And um, I, I think it's difficult whether we, whether we go back to step one and create a two-tier internet or an online presence, so you have a, a, a really secure pay subscription type internet that's fully secured by by government, etc., or, or or just have a um, an incognito type um, online presence. So you know, have a, have a hidden profile for online use only, and then have that break out to your, your normal life. I don't know. Um, it's, it's it's difficult. I mean, you know, we, we all live in this world of fear. Or you can t take this. Um, I had a thought the other week actually about. Just go out there and say, who cares? Who cares if someone steals my data? Who cares if they got my ID? Who cares? You know, I'm not interested. Just let them have it. They'll soon get bored with it. There'll be so much of it in the world very soon that people won't actually know it will be worthless to anyone. You know, so there's always that element of the way to look at it. Obviously, that could create problems with getting access to countries and things like this, because there's 10 of you already in the country. You know, so have some sort of reality over it. But yeah. <laughs> so. I, I think for me, two aspects. One, sorry, what Victoria meant. I, I think if money was no object and if there was the motivation to do so, education, awareness, I think it's the biggest step change we can make. But the reality is we're human beings. We don't want to learn necessarily everything all of the time, certainly parts of the population. So if I were to go for one, I, I'd say authentication because it's the gatekeeper. If you get authentication correct, then everything else tends to fall into place. So if your credentials aren't circumvented, if your passwords aren't broken, then generally the systems remain secure. I don't know what that secure authentication system necessarily looks like. I would advocate transparent biometrics, but there are certainly a wide variety of issues with that also. So I guess I'm aiming for a utopian technology that yet to exist, but in the area of authentication, I think would be, would be the biggest impact. Do you know any books we could buy about that, Nathan? I do. <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> okay, any more questions around the room? Looking, looking, looking. Okay, so we're coming towards the end of the panel slot. So just a final question, I suppose, to round things off and an opinion from each of you. I mean, basically, we're talking about the, the panel title, Cybercrime, Can We Keep Up? So are we keeping pace or are we perpetually going to be playing catch up? I think we are perpetually going to be playing catch up, and I think what's even worse is I think the the nature of cyber crime is increasing at a, a faster rate than we're able to catch up. And um, particularly, you know, as I pointed out earlier, the pervasiveness of technologies, the platforms, the different threats. Um, I struggle to manage, so I'm not quite sure how other parts of society, certainly our children and um, parents, are ever going to actually going to manage that in practice. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we, we are catch up. Um, there's, there's some, been some amazing advances in technology recently and um, how, how 
people are adapting to that, but uh, I think it's still slightly lagging, and there's always that new threat that comes to light, and once one threat vector's closed, another one opens and, and evolves, so I think we're yeah, slightly behind. I can only agree, really. We are playing catch-up, and all we can do is try our best to keep up with new technologies and the, the most recent threats and advice that we can, we can take on it, really. Okay, folks, so you heard the message. You need to keep aware and keep your eyes on what's happening because that's the only way to remain protected. And I think with that in mind, we should thank the panel very much for sharing their views. <laughs>